melting pot. By the way, I, I was surprised that there was a Russian translation to it. What year was the translation from? Can you, can you remember by any chance? More or less. Yeah. It's more, it's most modern. Oh, it's modern. It's not an old translation. I thought, who would translate it during Soviet time? No one would translate it. And, uh, and there's, such, there's such an attack on the Tsarist regime there that the author wouldn't translate it. So, I'm curious why it was translated and for what, for what purpose. Uh, I think to this day there is no Hebrew translation of it. It's a very American yeah. play with a message of America. Okay, so Israel Zangro, one of the really most, his dates are 1864 to 1926. Born and died in London, and one of the major, major figures of uh, modern Jewish culture and, uh, and letters and politics. Uh, now it's no longer there, but in the older British Library, when you went in, they had a list of 100 important people who, who went to the library. That included Marx and so forth. He was one of them. His name was on the wall. So, very much, uh, very important in many respects. Okay, so, he was born in London, 1864. The parents were immigrants from Russia. I think the mother came from Poland, but basically from the Tsarist Empire. Um, Father was very, very religious. Uh, the mother a little less so, but also a religious lady. And he was the oldest son, named Israel. Um, and uh, he received very special attention from his father. He would go with him to synagogue every uh, morning. And for his entire life, even though he was not religious later on, he had a very strong feeling for uh, liturgy, for prayers. He translated beautifully uh, Adon Olam and quite a few other uh, prayers. And uh, he had a soft, very soft spot for it. It, it carried meaning for him. Um, when he was a grown man, his parents uh, separated or divorced, I'm not quite sure. The father was the, the father was a bit of a shlumiel. He could never, they were poor. They ne he could never really make a living. He did this, he did that, he sold this. Never successful at anything in particular. And in, uh, at some point, the father moves to Jerusalem and lives there and also dies there. Um, the son, Israel, saw him when he was once uh, in Israel in 1897. Uh, they reunite. It's a very uh, emotional scene. He stayed with his father for a Passover Seder. And um, since I've done a lot of work on, on, on Zango, I also found uh, that when his uh, father died in 1908, he donated uh, a nice amount of money to the hospital in Jerusalem where his father died. The hospital is no longer in existence. Now, London is an interesting place at this time, and uh, Zangwill, in a way, benefits from the fact that, that his family immigrates before the, a little bit before the mass immigration arrives there. Just to give you a few numbers, in, in the year 1800, there were 8,000 Jews in all of England. Nothing. By 1850, there were 20,000 in London. By 
1887, which is getting us to the Angles time, there are 50,000. And by 1900, there were 160,000. So it's part of the great migration out of Eastern Europe into the West. Many of those stayed in London. Quite a few, as I told you before, used it as a, as a place for transmigration. That is to say, stayed for a while and then went to America. Uh, we even had a mayor in New York, a Beam, uh, some years ago, who was born in London and as a little baby came to America. So it, it was quite common. People stayed sometimes to collect some money, sometimes to see, you know, maybe they can find a life there. Some stayed, some went on. But uh, at the time, London was, after New York and Chicago, the largest center for East European Jewry. So, and the British Empire was, of course, the British Empire, and London was the biggest and most important city in the world. Now, uh, the British Jews, not the immigrants, created, they were also always nervous about these people who come from Eastern Europe with their kaftans and their religious and they speak Yiddish and how they behave and this and that. So they created a school that exists to this day. It's a very popular school, the Jews Free School. Today it's not free, I think, anymore. <laughs> but, but what the, 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 it was an excellent school, but the kids were put in uniform and the, the purpose was to anglicize them, to erase all these markers of East European Jewry, to turn them into Englishmen. And uh, this drive to anglicize, and of course they had a Jewish curriculum that, that they had. Um, you know, it was a, like a, 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 a dual sword. On the one hand, it gave somebody gifted like, like Israel, who was brilliant since he was a little kid, really a dazzling command of the English language, and uh, also a, a kind of claim to a state, to, to, to ownership of, uh, of the intellectual and artistic heritage of, of England, of Britain. On the other hand, it created a lot of anxiety in first uh, generation, or second generation, especially children, because at home there was Yiddish, and at, at school there was basically not a fight against Yiddish, but a fight for English, and, and who am I, and what do I do, and where do I belong, and, and yes, I love my parents who live like that, but at school I'm told this is not the way to, to, to do things. Um, this was because he was so brilliant, I think, found it easier to, to reconcile the two things, to, to, to walk both parallel lines without uh, getting confused. And so his, his literary career begins with he, when he's still at school. He writes a story called, that gets published, called Professor Grimmer, and the school is scandalized by the story. Why? Not because like a <laughs> good invention, but because it has a lot of Yiddishism in it. And they regarded, of course, the language as a kind of debased, low uh, jargon, the language of immigrant that represented everything they didn't want in Jewish life. So uh, Zangwill, throughout his life, made just the other opposite argument. He spoke of linguistic hybridity. You know what hybrid is? Like hybrid cars that use combination. Um, and to him it was not a negative thing at all to mix things. Um, he introduced freely Yiddishism into English as the, 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 the way speak, people spoke. Just as writers who came from Scotland or Ireland brought in the lingo of their own languages. So there was no, he was very much opposed to, to, to this erasure and uh, thought that uh, the dominant culture should 
incorporate these different sounds, these different words, and uh, so nothing wrong with this. Uh, not only that, but she said there are certain key words that you cannot translate. She said a shamus is not a beetle. It, it, it doesn't work. A shamus is a shamus, and a, 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 a Torah is a Torah, and a, 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 it brings in quite a few other words. And she said, you know what? You have to learn these words. They're part of an international thesaurus, and they enter the language, and this is it. And, if I'm writing in English, I, I bring these things in. I don't have to translate everything because it very often doesn't work. It doesn't convey the meaning of the word itself. So, uh, by the way, that's why, we'll get to it in a minute, in the melting pot, he writes the role of the old grandmother, if you noticed. I, I hope the translation kept it in Yiddish, which was a bold thing to do because the play is in English and the play is about America and da 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 and yet he said this is part of it and it's it's a very important statement to make uh, certainly at that time now uh, he starts a kind of dual life on the one hand he associates with various intellectuals of the Jewish world and uh, people who had tremendous impact on modern uh, Jewish life. Um, one of them is Solomon Schefter, if you know the name. Solomon Schefter was the first professor of rabbinics at, at Cambridge, and later went to New York to be the head of the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is where I come from. Uh, Lucian Wolf, who was a very major a journalist, uh, a historian and, and diplomat who participated in 1918 in the Paris peace talks. Um, uh, quite a few uh, others that uh, the name may not mean that much to you, but were very important people at the time in England uh, and in Jewish life. At the same time, he also develops a career in the Anglo world, you know, kind of parallel. And uh, becomes very friendly with people like Conan Doyle, if it means something to you, uh, Thomas Hardy, Rudyard Kipling, and the like. This is at the same, all of it at the same time. And uh, he also becomes uh, friendly with one of the great, great British actors of the time, Herbert Beerbohm Tree, and. Uh, becomes uh, the head of the Players Club. He's all over the place. But his big opportunity comes in 1890. Judge Mayer Salzberger, who's the head of the publication committee of the Jewish Publication um, uh, Society in America, wants to, just formed, it's a new thing, they, they still exist, JPS, want to publish a Jewish novel in English. And he cannot find someone in the United States. He goes to England and he contacts Zangwill and uh, commissions a novel. Zangwill at first hesitates a little bit. Do I want to enter the world of, of, of English literature as a, as a parochial writer, as a Jewish writer, or not, or what, but he was also afraid they would tell him what to do, the American, because it's a commissioned work, but at the end he says yes, and the result is Children of the Ghetto, the first Jewish bestseller in English, a real bestseller for many, many years, and still fun to read. I don't know if it was translated into Russian or not, but in, in it he does something very innovative. Note his use of the word ghetto. Ghetto until not very long before, and until the, the, the dissolution of the ghetto in Rome, was a place where you were forced to live as, as a Jew. 
But the children of the ghetto are not, is not about a ghetto in that sense of the word. Nobody forces you to live in the ghetto. He's talking about the East End, which is the equivalent of, of the Lower East Side in, in New York. And he uses this academically incorrect term, but in a way that we use it to this day. Right? We talk about ghetto music and ghetto literature, and, um, and within a very short while, quite a few things appear with the word ghetto in them. It all comes from him. He changes the meaning of it. I'm not talking now about World War II and, and the return to the old meaning of ghetto. But ghetto, in, in what sense? What's a ghetto today? When you say ghetto music, what do we mean? Nothing closed, Jewish and closed, and understandable uh, only in Jewish culture or little. No, it doesn't have to be Jewish. Ghetto music today is usually black, by the way. Right. <laughs> but it's it's ghetto in the sense of closed, uh, uh, closed, close, yeah, of. It's usually associated with people more at the margin of society, not at the center of it, that uh, live together and create their kind of subculture within the larger culture. And, and he's really the first one to use it. After him, you begin to have one after the other. His book comes out in 1892. Uh, is a really an immense bestseller, not just in Jewish circles, in general. It makes him a, a real liter, literary star. But you get Avram Khan's Yekel, A Tale of the uh, New York Ghetto in 1896, Hermann Heilmann, a Dutch uh, a playwright, in 1899 writes a play uh, called The Ghetto. Uh, Maurice Rosenfeld's Yiddish uh, songs are translated into English as songs of the ghetto. Hutchins Hapgood writes about the Lower East Side and it's called The Spirit of the Ghetto. So on and on it goes. And in 1903, Jack London comes to London and uh, further elasticizes this term and calls the entire area of East London a ghetto where he, as he sees it, the dominant class confines its, its undesirable but necessary workers. So the modern use of the word ghetto comes from Israel's angle, and that's already a contribution. Now, uh, Children of the Ghetto, writing it, really forced Zangwill to face his own Jewish identity. Who am I? What, what am I? He was a very young man. He was 26 when the book came out. And um, in the memoirs of, of uh, Cyrus Adler, uh, a very important uh, uh, American at the time, uh, he comes to, to uh, he comes to Zangwill and says, how do you look at the Jewish people in your book? And Zangwill, very cocky he was, says, it's artistic material. And Adler pushes him a little bit and says, have you any other interest in the Jewish people except as artistic material? And he says, no. And so Adler says, if that is the case, we do not want your book. Two days later, a package arrives, and just before Adler goes back to America, and it contains Zangwill's story. He wrote a lot of short stories. Uh, the Diary of a Meshumet. You know what a Meshumet is? Meshumet is a convert out of Judaism. With the note, I'm leaving one of my stories. You will probably judge from it that I have more than artistic interest in the Jewish people. And of course, that uh, became uh, this big, big, big and popular novel that was reprinted for many, many, many years to come. Now, in 1890s, Angle also becomes a political man. Uh, in 1895, he meets in London Theodore Herzl. Herzl doesn't know Zangle, doesn't Zangle, doesn't know Herzl. 
how do they come together? Because this is still a year before Herzl published his, his Jewish State, uh, but he's already working with Max Nordau. And Max Nordau published with the same publisher, Heinemann, a Zangwill. Herzl comes to England. He doesn't have English. He speaks French and German, but not English. And he has no contact. He doesn't know anyone. So uh, uh, Nordau says, you know, you should contact this guy. We work with the same publisher. He's interested in things Jewish. And there's a wonderful description how uh, Herzl comes to his house. And written by Zangwill's brother, his brother who also wrote, was not as successful as him, but was also a writer. And they say he came like an Assyrian king. He was a very good looking man, very imposing. And uh, he begins to talk about his plan and his ideas. And at first they look at him as if he came out of, <laughs> out of nowhere. But Herzl makes a few very interesting, um, uh, brings up a few very interesting ideas and he's captivated Israel. Uh, he says that no nation, and that's important, even to our discourse today, his uniformity of race. There's no such thing, he says. He completely rejected, this is the age of nationalism, he rejects completely a racial inter interpretation of the Jews. What he says is, that's Herzl, we're a historical unit, a nation with anthropological diversities. We're different. The different Jews, what we have is a shared history and culture, not race. Very, very different from most European national thinking at the time. And not only that, he gets very excited, uh, Herzl, that they're Jews that are not Ashkenazi, not white, that they're Kurdish Jews and Persian Jews and Indian Jews and Ethiopian Jews. He thinks it's wonderful. And uh, Zangwill, see how things connect, is influenced by this and basically brings the same idea, not only to Jews, but also to America. There's no racial unity. We are a mix of different people with different heritage that are united by geography and by history, but not by race. In fact, in, uh, in 1903, when he, uh, he talks, he gives an interview, and he says, the Jews are a universal race. Everybody can be, is a Jew. And when he writes about, um, he comes to the first Jewish Congress in Basel, and writes a beautiful story. He's not yet a Zionist, but he, he covers it. He's interested. And he, his most beautiful description is of the different delegates. And he, he describes the ethnic diversity of them. This is dark, and this is blonde, and this is tall, and this is short, and this comes from here, and this comes from here. And, and this, he thinks, is the most beautiful thing that he finds at the Congress, in addition, of course, to the ideology. In 1911, there was a, you know, there was a lot of talk about race at the first half of the 20th century. There was a race Congress in London, and he gave a talk, and he explained in that quote, he said, every people are a hodgepodge, you know what a hodgepodge? They're a mishmash of races. There is no such thing as pure race. He said, Jews, he spoke mostly about Jews, are mainly a white people, but they also have black, brown, and yellow fringes. He embraces homogeneity, the very opposite of what's happening in most of Europe at the time. Okay, so, in, he watches, he watches, but he doesn't quite join. By 1901, Zangwill abandons this observer's position and joins the Zionist Federation. 
serving um, as an official representative in the Fifth Zionist Congress. And from this point, his energy, his pen, his connections, his personal money, all go into Zionist activities. In fact, so much so that he declares that he stopped being a novelist and became a Zionist <laughs> as, a, as a profession. And uh, what, he, what he says is that now with the crumbling of the ghetto walls, the Jew has reached a point of a parting of the way. Things, he said, cannot go on as they are. The old world is gone, and there are really two options. Either, he said, become a member of an international religious community, or, as he calls it, obey the trumpet call of Isaiah and nationalize and create a Jewish homeland. National existence with its own culture. And then in 1903, what happens? Kishinev happens. And Kishinev, even though by today's standards, unfortunately, of, of the Holocaust is not so impressive to us, the 48 Jews dead, uh, 500 wounded, a lot of looting and burning, but at the time, it was a cataclysmic event. It sort of sent a message that diaspora life in Eastern Europe, at least, is, is, is no longer possible. Uh, it was like a, a thunderbolt. The beginning of the 20th century, that is supposed to be the century of progress and, and, and all these uh, uh, wonderful things, starts with the pogrom, and the bad pogrom. Um, and uh, especially one day where the czarist authorities basically kept quiet. In England, it, it hits a nerve. Uh, one of the not Jewish, Pall Mall magazine, asks if, if, if Russia could be counted among the civilized nations. Uh, a question that you can ask every so often. Uh, Zandro writes, a great ballet doesn't make you a great nation. Uh, but the Jewish hopelessness is, it, 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 at that point is, uh, is clear. He calls for nationalization. Some people say, yeah, but what about the Bible where it says all of us have to be brothers? He says, yes, in order to have a brother, you need to have a me. Without a me, you don't have a brother. You need at least two to, to make a brother. So um, the situation is dire if they're looking for a place for Jews to go to, to really escape what they're dealing with. And Herzl gets a special offer from Britain that we know today, we call it the Uganda mm -hmm. affair. And it's the first time really in history that a, a foreign government is offering uh, Jews from other nations, not British Jews, a piece of land where they can uh, settle and be part of uh, the British Empire, but have their own rights and their own national home. Herzl gets very excited over it, brings it to the Zionist Congress, um, talking about a place of refuge, a place to escape. And uh, the delegates from Eastern Europe don't really like it because it was always Zion and, and the land of Israel. And, uh, but it's Herzl, so they postpone it. And they, what, do, what, what do you do when you want to postpone something? You create a committee, a committee to study. Um, the, the, the idea is strongly uh, supported by Nordau and Zandwell. They are considered the triumvirate of early Zionism, Herzl, Nordau, and Zandwell. And uh, <coughs> what happens is Herzl dead. Herzl dies in 1904 before the next Congress, and things are left 
open. So here's this feeling that, uh, you know, the Zionists talk a lot, but don't do anything. The situation in Russia gets worse and worse. There's a series of pogroms. So what, eager for a quick answer to, to the clearly deteriorating situation, uh, Zangwill and some of the others, some of his colleagues, break away from the Zionist Federation and create the Jewish Territorial Organization, ITO. Have you heard of it? The Territorialist. The Territorialist, uh, ITO, starts, is very full of energy and activism and starts looking for a territory for Jews. And you begin to have a series of, of searches for Italian. Where can you go for colonization? So they, they, there's talk of Canada, there's talk of Australia, and then there's talk of Mesopotamia and Angola and Zeranaika and this and that. Nothing happens at the end. But Zango is very, very active. Uh, in all this, and of course never takes a penny, only puts in his own personal money into all this. In 1917, he rejoins the Zionist movement. Why? What happened in 1917? The Balfour Declaration. Balfour Declaration. But he's always a little uh, cautious with this because he is aware of the Arab population in Palestine. And he writes about it. Um, but he rejoins with all his heart, and by the way, all his papers are in the Zionist archive in Jerusalem, even though he's been to Israel only once in 1897. And, uh, he went there with a the delegation and also met with his father. Now, in night, this brings us closer to the melting point. In 1906, he meets with, a, with a, uh, an American Jewish philanthropist, Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff, we, had a, we have a building named after him at, at JTS. Schiff, C-H-I-F-F. -F. His collection of Judaica, by the way, is the basis of the Jewish Museum in New York. Very committed to, to Jewish affairs and um, he asked him to join forces, to have Ito join forces with him. The, the purpose is to rescue Russian Jews. Um, and to organize for the first time, and that's also historical, a methodical system of immigration to the United States. Not to the big cities, because there you had slums, and, and uh, the general population was becoming more and more anti-immigration but take them to other parts of the United States. And with this comes the beginning of what's called the Galveston Plan. Galveston is a port in Texas. And the way it works out is that Ito would select the people to go. Organized immigration, this is a new concept. Choose people with professions, younger people under the age of 40, bring them to parts of the United States where there are very few Jews, settle them in, di in different uh, areas, and around them communities will begin to be built. And it takes place, it actually happens. The, these Jews come to Germany, to Bremen, from Bremen, uh, there they get uh, assistance from German Jewry. They go to um, Galveston. And uh, at first he hesitates a little bit, but he goes with it for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, it's better than nothing. And B, he feels that it would also give them some experience in terms of immigration, of how to actually really handle it. And so, uh, the melting pot is a direct result of this. And he says it, the, the, the Galveston movement, this whole big, big and very interesting enterprise, 
He said, if you're a businessman, you do it, you're involved in it, and this is it. But if you're a literary man, it, it, it does something to you. You see all kinds of situations, all kinds of issues, and, um, and that is bound to, to have some effect on you. And that is the, 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 the basic uh, uh, impetus for, for the play. Now, um, in the meanwhile, he keeps writing for the stage. Uh, Children of the Ghetto become a stage in 1899 in New York. All his Jewish plays are written for America, for an American producer. And it's very interesting. Who doesn't like it? The uptown Jews. They're uncomfortable. They don't want to see all the going should see the, the, the Yiddish, uh, the, this Yiddish life on the stage. They will make fun of us. They will laugh at us. I, as an upper class German Jew, I don't want to be associated with these people in the Lower East Side. I, I don't like it. And, and they practically kill the play. There's great interest in it, but they, they, uh, they don't want it. They don't want all this ghetto stuff. And they have a dilemma in general because with Zango, because here he comes. He's the most famous Jewish writer in English. So, you know, you invite him if you want. But on the other hand, please don't write about the ghetto. You don't want to. So the ambivalence is there. But on the stage for the whole world, not just to read, but to see, no, better not. And they, they literally sabotage it. They, uh, make it very hard. Now, a few years later, there are a few other plays that he writes, but the next American play is The Melting Pot. In the meanwhile, he has become a good friend of President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, they're in touch. They, uh, he met him originally in New York. And the play, I don't know if it's in the translation, was dedicated to him. Yeah. Okay. And he comes, first he came with this big word ghetto, now he comes with a new symbol, the melting pot. Think for a second, what does it mean? What's a melting pot? What association? And it's a word we use to this day. Every discussion in America somehow takes you back to this symbol. It, it encapsulates a whole idea, a big idea. What's a melting pot? What's it's the idea? It's like that we all can be made from different material, but at the end we all may be united in one. They'll be united, okay. And so, now this very popular uh, symbol of Israel, when it's the symbol of uh, Exactly, Israel. the same thing. But you see, Americans don't think of it, but the connection here between Zionism, which had the same idea for Jews, and America, for all of humanity, it's the same idea. He carries it. It still starts, in fact, with Herzl's idea of non-racial nations. It's something different. It, it's not race. So I, I have to tell you, I was a little astounded. I don't know how it's in, in the Ukraine, but 20 Two, I think, years ago, I was in Moscow, and I went to uh, Moscow University to, to visit the gentleman who was the professor, who was the head of all the Semitic uh, languages there. He was a very nice guy. We started talking, and he told me that he was born in Egypt. But his parents were communists, and they left Egypt. They went to England, and then went to the Soviet Union you know, to build socialism. And all his education, everything, is he was a child when he came to Russia. And he's now this big professor at, at Moscow University. And I jokingly said to him, so now you're Russian. He looks at me and calls his secretary. Uh, Svetlana, come here. Svetlana comes, she's a very Russian lady. And she's, he said to her, Svetlana, am I Russian? 
person like this if she doesn't <laughs> know exactly what to do in family, she says, well, uh, no. You're Soviet, but you're not Russian. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, that means that <laughs> common geography does not turn you into, you still keep your separate identities. Uh, Zango would be a poor would abhor it, would be shocked by, by this kind of a statement. I don't know how it is in the Ukraine. What's your... Oh, <laughs> really? Yes. Yes. Ukraine was a part of Soviet Union, so it's... Yeah, but now, no. still you're it's Ukrainian there. or do you still have your, your ethnic identity? It's there are different... Are you Armenian and Jew and... There are different ideological groups, there are uh, eth ethnic nationalists... Passport. Uh, passport no national. Uh, no, 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 no national. No. Okay. Oh. Ukrainian citizenship, as that's all. Okay, because in Russia you. In but Putin played this uh, this nationality that there are Russian mm -hmm. people in Ukraine, but they are Ukrainian citizens. So he he's playing with this. Okay. All right. Let's not get into politics here. But you see, this is a very very different take on what is the meaning of a nation. Okay. And the symbol, the prestige of the melting pot has gone up and down. There were also uh, uh, opponents to it, but the truth of the matter is that it has become a global term. It's used everywhere. It's not used only in America, only in Israel, it's used in France, it's used in England, it's used in, in, in so many um, multi-ethnic uh, societies. <clears throat> so, even the, the, the metaphors that came sort of against the, the melting pot, and they're not very successful, but they're grounded in it. What do we have? We have, melt, uh, we have salad bowl, stew, you know what the stew is. No. <laughs> Mosaic, <coughs> symphony, the melting pot still stays as a central image. And think of it, it's a melt, the melting pot basically emphasizes process, not outcome. The process of what happens in there. And so basically what it offers is, is a futuristic vision, because what it offers you is a process, not a result, of something that is constantly, and it's in the play, seething, uh, uh, melting, fusing, bubbling. Um, and it, it has all kinds of meanings. On the one hand, there's something a little medieval in it, right? Uh, a kind of, uh, something of the occult. But on the other hand, it also reminds us of a kitchen. And home. And, and so it invokes ideas of food and of, of nourishment and of magic, of all sorts of, of, of things that we can smell and hear and taste. And, and it's very rich in symbolism. Now, basically, Zangwill's rhetoric of immigration is embedded in the Exodus saga. And he sees a God, he was not a religious man in the terms of practice, but yes, religious in the terms of, of the more abstract idea. He sees God as the dynamo that makes all this work. And so God propels this great human fusion that is going to happen. And so he, he, he puts in America a certain, um, a certain idea that you hear also quite often there, that it's providential that God is somehow uh, guiding uh, his a kind of divine covenant with the United States of America. 
uh, this is a kind of religion, mystical aspect that some people like, some people like to dress, but it's certainly there. Now, some people don't like the idea of a melting pot because they say, like Henry Ford, in his factory, had a whole a pageant of a melting pot. So what would, it, what would happen there? People would come dressed in their different national costumes, and there would be this big pot, and they would come out of it all dressed the same, all looking the same as Americans. Zangwill hated this idea. He, he said, I never meant it to be a complete loss of self. Not at all. I don't want America, he said, to be like China. <laughs> Meaning, not very nice to say, but everybody looks to him at least the same. I don't want monotonous millions. It's a process where one affects the other, where things merge, and are constantly in the state of flux. It's interesting to note for a moment the changes in the play's uh, title. Originally, he wanted to call it the Mills of God. Mill is where you make flour. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, the idea of, of mixing, of distilling into the food. Then, uh, it didn't work, so he called it the crucible. The crucible is a similar idea. Thank God he didn't use it because Arthur Miller wrote a play many years later called the crucible. Then he wanted to call it the God of our children. And finally, it ended up with the melting pot. I saw the manuscript where he, he literally erased the title and wrote the melting pot by hand on the type manuscript. The timing was perfect, 1908. There were massive waves of immigration from Eastern Europe and from Southern Europe. And, and, and there was tremendous attention given to it, and there was a need for some word that would, would somehow an image that would that would sum it up, because everybody felt that the fabric of America is changing, and uh, somehow this this melting pot uh, imagery encapsulated all these different uh, ideas that were around at the time. And it's been with us for more than a hundred years. So the idea of melting, just a second. Um, in a way, it starts earlier, already in, in, uh, in the 18th century, there's a, a Frenchman who comes to America, um, uh, uh, John de Crevoquer, and he writes what, a famous essay, What is an American? And he says, as an example, the grandfather was an Englishman, his wife Dutch, his son married to a French woman, with a couple's four sons married to wives of different nations. And this Frenchman said, here individuals of all nations are melted, that's the word, into a new race of men whose labors and posterity will one day cause great changes in the world. This is still in the 18th century. Uh, later on, uh, Emerson, again, major, major American thinker, also brings, brings up this idea. And uh, so the idea is somehow in the abstract, but Zengo is the one who brings it together and turns it into a play. Okay? Uh, again, I want to, to emphasize that he kept saying, and he still met Hitler before he died. Hitler is already starting, he didn't know where it would lead, but the, the whole idea that, that racial purity he said, is absolute nonsense. It's idiotic. There is no such thing, it's stupid. And it, it's, it's the worst thing that we, we can come up with. So, history, he says, is always a process of fusion. There, even for Jews, he said, a group that did not so quickly uh, mingle with others, uh, even there, we have non-white uh, Jews, 
uh, we have Jews in India, we have Jews in Jamaica, we have uh, Jews in Africa, and uh, in a way he says the Jew is the common measure of humanity because he entered all these places. So wherever you look, there's a Jew. So the Jews cement all of humanity into, into one thing, and, uh, and there's no supremacy of anybody in this. Uh, every nation, he says, is a melting pot. Every society is a melting pot. The, the, what happens with America is a question of degree. In most places, it happens much slower, gradually. Here, in America, it's massive. It's fast. The numbers are huge. This is the difference. But in principle, this is the rule of history. Okay? So, I have to say that he does not idealize America as a land. He has no particular feeling for the, for the, uh, um, for the land itself, for the rivers, for the mountains. America to him is primarily an idea. And he knows it primarily through American Jews at the end. Okay? So now let's see some of our... Wait, how do I get to the PowerPoint? Uh, help, 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 help. <clears throat> Okay, so this is Israel Tango when he's young. Beautiful, he never was. <laughs> but here he is in the, the year he died. An older man. This is my book, and this is a caricature of him that appeared. The melting pot. This is. Well, it's not a pot, it's a cup, and it's long, it's not long, but quite a few years before Zangwill. Well, it's not called that, it's called the ones that do not melt. And who are the ones who do not melt in America? This is from a magazine called Puck. Who doesn't, who doesn't fit in? White people? No, no. You see all the different people are there. There's the one who doesn't. Doesn't see it. Anything. The Irish. Irish. Oh, Not the Jews. The Irish. Things have changed since then. Okay. Here we have some uh, pictures from the production. This is the British production, which was very successful. I have no pictures from the American production. Um, you see at the entrance, this is when he just comes home. What do you notice there? On top of the door? American flag. And what's on the door itself? A mezuzah. Oh, cool. This is the mixture. This is a grandmother. Friday night, again, you see the Jewish candelabra uh, there. <coughs> this is uh, Act Two with her Pappelmeister, who declares uh, David Kehan, who we'll get to in a minute, is a great genius. And uh, this is. Uh, Quincy Davenport, the one real American of the play who's the greatest idiot <laughs> and shallow and irresponsible man around. So, all the others are immigrants. Pappelmeister is German. Uh, Vera is <coughs> Russian. Uh, the others are Russian Jews, so. Okay, this is a film. The film is gone, it was lost. It's a silent film. But note the imagery. I think it's interesting to see the mountain point. You know, those early films that just, just uh, the Civil War just disintegrated. Here we have Kathleen, the, the Irish maid, who had learned all the Jewish things that can also bubble and 
a little bit in Yiddish, and, and she knows about Treyf, and about kosher, and about this holiday, and that holiday. Uh, well, guess who this is? This is the, the, the Baron, the Russian Baron, and his French wife, and Davenport, <coughs> who, uh... Ask, uh for <laughs> Does he look like a Russian baron? Not so. No? Not so. Ah. This is the final scene, uh, which we'll read. And you see, this is all the way up. You see the New York Harbor, and what you see here? The Statue of Liberty, the symbol of America. And the play ends with these lines. And I have to tell you, to this day, uh, you know, he stands there after his music has been played. This genius boy on the top, you can't go any higher, like Moses on, on, on you know, standing on Sinai. And he gives this big speech. And he says, there she lies, the great melting pot. Listen, can't you hear the roaring and the bubbling? There gapes her mouth the harbor where a thousand mammoth feeders come from the ends of the world to pour the human freight. Ah, what a stirring and a seething. Stealth and Latin, Slav and Teuton, Greek and Syrian, black and yellow, Yes, east and west and north and south, the palm and the pine, the pole and the equator, the crescent and the cross. How the great alchemist melts and fuses them with his purging flame. Here shall they all unite. What is the glory of Rome and Jerusalem compared with the glory of America? where all races and nations come to labor and look forward. This is a big, big speech at the end uh, of the play. I have to tell you, uh, before I continue, the, the play, a few years ago, the play doesn't get produced now. It's really an old war horse, uh, unlike the other things that we've read. But a few years ago, a small theater in New York, uh, that specializes in older play, provide the play. And I, it's a long play. It, 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 it takes a long time to watch it. And I asked them if they were, cut, they were not cutting a word of it. And they asked me to do a talk back. You know, after the show. And, people, and I said, sure, but I'm, I, I don't think anyone will stay so late. Well, all right, they came. The audience was not a Jewish audience. It was a totally mixed audience. To my great surprise, almost everybody stayed on. And people started saying, people from, from uh, China, people from, from various countries said, it's just like my family. It, it, it was quite incredible and they felt the need to talk about it. And there was something common here to, to both in terms of the hope and the, the clashes between generations that, that somehow worked for them, that uh, kept them very, very interesting. So, uh, let's go then um, and see what happens here. One of the things, for, for instance, that are, that are a problem there is intermarriage. Intermarriage in the play is an, is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, first of all, it's not between a Jew and an American. It's between two previous enemies. <laughs> between a Russian Jew who was lost his family in the pogrom and, and himself is also physically hurt by it, and a Russian aristocrat who left Russia, came to America, rebelled against her family, and uh, 
and marries him. So, so it's a, a kind of peacemaking in terms of Russia, not so much in terms of America, because at the end, you have the feeling they're both going to speak Russian to each other. <laughs> okay. Secondly, it's interesting because he is the one who accepts her and not the other way around. It used to be the case with intermarriage. Intermarriage between Jew and Gentile would, would uh, normally put the, the, the Jew in a kind of lower position and uh, it would be the Gentile who accepted the, the uh, the Jew, not the other way around. Not here. Uh, wait, I'm looking for my page numbers. So, here it is. Okay. Second. So, um, the Baron. The Baron turns out that the problem that, that uh, David has with marrying Vera are not exactly religious because he's not really religious anymore. What is his problem? Your father killed his family. Yeah. And by the way, Vera is probably influenced by someone that that we met in London, that's Vera Zasulich. Do you know who she was? Okay. Oh, now at least you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so uh, Zasulich never came to America, but but Zasulich was also very uh, um, pro-Jewish and made sure that uh, the, the uh, Kishinev program is fully uh, written up and that nothing anti-Semitic uh, is written in the, in the paper that she was involved with. So probably Vera is a soulish, I'm not sure. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, her father is also based on a more or less real person. He changed his name a little bit. Uh, not much. Uh, not Ravenga, what was his name? Something very, very similar who was the chief of police. But what happens there? Why, why does David have such a problem? At the end, he, he said, no, we can't. There's a problem. What? Yeah. What's between us? He uses, there's too much blood. Yeah. 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 Too much blood. The, the, the pogrom. Because she was also pogrom. Yeah, but she, she was no longer, she wasn't there. She didn't. She didn't know. She was revolutionary. She was a revolutionary, but the father was the head of police there. And so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a problem not of religion, but of personal pain and memories and those eyes that always run after him. One of the, the scenes that everyone was shaken by was the description of the pogrom that is in the play. And that's interesting because originally it was not in the play. It was in the play and the actor who played the part said to the producer, you know, I feel I need more, more material for David rejecting Vera. It's not enough. And the, and the, the producer sent him to England with Zangle is, and he walks with Zangle, and Zangle said, yeah, I didn't want to put all the horror in. But he said, you know, it has to be in there for people to understand. And Zangle goes home, sits down, writes it, and it gets into the, into the play. Quite a, a, a horrible scene, but it is what it is. So, let's go to the Play itself, Charlotte's. I'm not sure what the pages are here. Wait, how do we go back to the to the script? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm troubling you, but no, that's not good. Okay, this I showed you. No. No. Oh. 
No, this is from the PowerPoint. This is not the table. Well, wait, don't, don't be so funny. <laughs> Just to show you how ingrained this image became in American consciousness of the melting pot. Here there's nothing Jewish, of course, but it's it just a postcard that I found from around the First World War. Okay, so let's go to this. Okay, so this is this one. Look at this. Look at all the combination. All the people coming, but not from one direction, from different direction. Here we have the Statue of Liberty with the text written by a Jewish poet, of course, you know that, Emma Lazarus. And here we have this nothing. It's it's quite a quite a powerful image. It's and like the uh, red stripes. No, <laughs> they, no, they like come from that. different from different paths, from different ways. Any comment on this? Is there... This is like an American flag. Uh, red and white mm -hmm. uh, yeah. stripes and yeah. a blue... Yeah. In a way, yeah. It's blue. It's in a, uh, and now like you have to see what the Yiddish is did to him. This. <laughs> that was Schmerz <laughs> <laughs> that uh, a little funny. He looks like <laughs> he was very thin, like a, a undernourished cook, a chef who stands <laughs> and stirs the melting pot. So the 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 play, of course. Let's, let's go to the play for a second. The, the play created uh, quite a discussion because said, people said, wait a second, this is this gung-ho Zionist nationalist. The, the, the question was raised, how can this Jewish nationalist, this firebrand Zionist, write a play about America? It doesn't doesn't fit. Well, the explanation comes from his view of Judaism of the time. Either or, I spoke about it at the beginning. Either nationalize and create your own country and your own state, or go to America, Europe. He said is a lost case. There's nothing to, to look for in Europe. But go to America where you have a certain special stock because the Puritans, the ones who established America, he said we're all Bible people. So it's your Bible that is the basis of what happens there and contribute to the uh, general uh, well-being of that new society. Uh, and intermarriage, he was very practical about it. He himself was intermarried, by the way. His wife uh, was not Jewish. By the way, Nordau's wife was not Jewish either. And Herzl had no problem with that. He said that your children, will, if, if you're in a Zionist uh, a state, your children will be Jewish. That's it. Uh, he, uh, but. Uh, he also said, look, in this modern world where Jews and non-Jews live together and interact and we're out of the ghetto, the walls of the ghetto have fallen, you cannot avoid it. And at the time that he wrote the play, it was very rare. There was very little intermarriage in America. But he really, in this sense, he was a prophet. He really saw where things were going. He understood modernity in a way that many of the people uh, of his time did not. And if you noticed in the play, there is a point where his uh, uncle, who's like the father figure, says to him, you cannot marry a, a non-Jew. And he said, well, in that case, you should have gone to become a Zionist and gone to, to the land of Israel and not come to America. 
So these are the two venues that he offers world jewelry at the time. And uh, I have to say that in many, many ways, he was right. Many of his predictions happened. The one thing that he really did not foresee is Nazism. I don't think, I, and I honestly think that had he lived longer, at the end he simply collapsed and, 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 and died. But had he lived longer, his voice was heard throughout the world. If you go and look at, at old newspapers, you look at the internet, the name Zangwill appears thousands and thousands of times. People listen to him. I think, um, I think he could have said something. I think he could have spoken in a way that nobody else did at the time. But he died well before it. Uh, his wife, he left his, his money to, not, not very much was left because he spent it all on his, on his uh, activities. Uh, his wife, a, a little naively, uh, said that she want well, the money should go to one of two options. Either a national theater in Jerusalem, or she also wanted to have a body of two people, a man and a woman, because he was for suffrage all the way. He was an honorary member of the suffrage uh, uh, group in, in, in England. The man and the woman who will go around the world and whatever they see a problem, that a hard time that is given to Jews, they will come and talk about it and the world will do something about it. A little naive, but, uh, but a kind of watchman for Jewish rights around the world. And his wife survived him. Uh, she died after the Second World War. She, she lived much longer than him. His children are a bit of a sad story. Um, one, one, the older son that they had, and it was a very happy marriage, he and Edith. Uh, she totally supported him, and she herself became a very flamboyant Zionist and spoke in Zionist conferences and so forth. Uh, the oldest son was an engineer and went to South America uh, where he married um, somebody with a very Spanish name, non-Jewish, and then ended up in Texas. And there are remnants of this family to this day, but they're all mixed. The daughter had a mental breakdown and spent the entire Second World War in a sanatorium in Switzerland. And the youngest son uh, became a, a professor of psychiatry, very well known in, in Cambridge. And, and the story that I was told by family members, it does not appear in books, was that um, he also married, he married out of the face, he married a non-Jewish woman, had a baby, and the baby was about to be christened. And just before the christening at home, there was a fire, and the baby was killed in the fire. It was a horrible scene, and, and then he had no more children. Uh, but, but a member of the family said to me, you know, it's, it's if some sort of a force came out and said, the grandchild of, of, of Israel Zengel cannot be baptized. I don't know. <clears throat> but the family is still around. I met the son of his brother in London. And we spoke on the phone and I said, well, how? I, no, I didn't say it. I then thought, oh my God, how will I recognize him? This. It looks just like him. <laughs> Took me two seconds to realize it was him. So um, Zangle is still very much a name to be reckoned with. In a way, he, as I used to say, he fell a little bit into the ocean because, on the one hand, he's British, 
But on the other hand, his important work is about America. <coughs> so, but he's not American. So it, 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 it somehow doesn't fully fit. And it's interesting that after the war, his son, the one who was a professor at, at Cambridge, had to decide what to do with all his papers. There were tons and tons of papers. And the decision was to give it to the Zionist Archive in Jerusalem, which is where most of his papers are located. Of course, you go to libraries all over, you find them, but correspondence with, with, uh, with all kinds of people. But that, he felt, was the right identity, the right place for his father's uh, memory. So this is the story of Israel Zangwill. And uh, those were the three, the three people who stood at the very beginning of the Zionist movement. The three, Herzl, Nordau, and Zangwill. And they all have streets named after them in Israel. Okay, questions about the play. Why is the Mountain Park House so strange structure? Yeah, why every chapter begins with this, uh, it repeats in the previous chapter? Like, in what? Russian translator, no? <coughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh. No, here I have a play. No, no. No. Uh, how, wait a second. How many acts do you? How, how many acts does the Russian translation have? There are four acts. It was a little bit Some changed. Yeah, uh, because I'll tell you the play. truth. I I don't read Russian. I found it. Somebody helped me find it. I sent it to uh, David Fishman, and I said, "Is it okay? Is it correct?" Know, because I cannot judge, and said yes, it's okay. So I sent it to you. But it's no. Nine chapter each. Yeah. Nine. But not acts. Four no. acts. What? No. Four acts. acts. Yeah, it's not like they change is just uh, as a uh, not a theatrical play. It was changed uh, just as a no. story uh -huh. novel. With the chapter. You're kidding. Yeah, but very, very strange. You can find it online, the whole text, but in English, not in, not in Russian. That's why I asked you why was it translated, because it was a little, uh, it was interesting to me. We know that uh, Kaminska, Esther Ochl Kaminska, produced the play in Poland, but without the last act. The last act is when they do marry. So she finished it where they say there's nothing can happen between us and that's it. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't, didn't realize that. So I'll ask Lana to send you the, the, the link. This is a real play. It was a story, what you got? And David didn't know it. it a it was a change as a structure of this play. No, that's not right. No, it was a play and it opened in Washington and Theodore Roosevelt stood up there and said, yelled, it's a great play, Mr. Zangwill. And, and of course, the, the, the whole country was interested in it and, and that's why the play uh, devoted to him. And years later, Roosevelt wrote that that play had a very big influence on his thinking and uh, on, on various policies that he, uh, that he developed. And Roosevelt was really, uh, as they called it, a friend to, to, to the Jews. He was a very fair man and, and incorporated uh, Jews into his administration, which was not the case before. So all this is not in the play. Mea culpa, but what can I do? It's, it's very hard when you deal with two languages, <laughs> one of which you don't know. All right. So at least now you know you know where to find it. You want me to give you the the uh, exact. Uh, this is easily available. Nothing it took me two minutes to find it. 
Uh, I also have the different the chapters, the, the, the acts, four acts. It's a long play. How long was this story? It wasn't very long. I don't know. I read it for a It's a very long play, 336. I'll tell you exactly how many pages. It's this whole book is the play. And you read this last monologue of David. In this book, it was not a monologue, it was a dialogue between Vera and David. It's very, very it starts at page 269 and goes to page 363. It's a long play. It's almost 100 pages. Sorry. I, I really, I checked it first with someone I thought. It was know. just a plot. No, the story. So I don't understand why you said didn't say it to me. But what am I going to do? All right, but you can read it. It's there. And, and I was surprised there was a, a, a Russian translation. I'll be honest with you. Wonderful, we can do it. All right. Tomorrow we are switching to um, an Israeli play. Uh, and we're going to deal with the with the impact of uh, the Holocaust. A play that I think played here too called Ghetto by Yoshua Sobol. It's a quite contemporary play. So we're getting away from the beginning of the of the uh, 20th century and we're moving to the end of it or to the beginning of the 21st uh, century. And we'll also see some scenes uh, from from the production of the play. Um, not a film, but actual production, and I, I'm also curious to hear from you because the Holocaust has become a very, very major topic um, in terms of really of defining Jewish identity. Uh, in America, what you get is, is uh, uh, two things: either the the story of immigration or Holocaust. These are the things that define American Jewry. And Israel also more and more defines itself through that. You see when uh, Trump was in Israel just now, where did they take him? Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem has become a, uh, the place you have to go to. It was not like that years ago. It was not uh, uh, the place that, that stood for Jewish identity, but over the last uh, several decades, this is uh, what it became. And, uh, and I, I also want, I would like to hear from you if this is the same here or not. Or, um, I don't know. <laughs> we are more than a melting pot. More than a melting pot. Yeah. Everything is mixed. Uh, the the uh, my feeling was again when I was in Russia years ago that the Holocaust was not as big a thing there because so many Russians died in the war so they they didn't uh, they didn't make such a big deal over it overall I don't I don't know what to say to you. But think of it a little bit, the, really the place of, of, of the Holocaust in, in today's uh, identity. I mean, I, I can think of the last Jewish play that I saw in New York, it was a Jewish-Jewish play, but in English, not for a Jewish audience, it was called Bad Jews. And basically it's about three young cousins uh, who's, who get together because their grandfather died. And they fight each other. Essentially, the, the grandfather uh, left a, a, a necklace with a chai, and who will get it? And, and that sustained him in the concentration camp. Meaning, who will be the heir of the past? But it, it, it all, all tends to constantly go back to the Holocaust. <coughs> and even Arthur Miller was Jewish and avoided Jewish topics for a long time. Um, when he starts 
writing about things Jewish, he writes broken glass, which is not exactly about Holocaust, but the trauma of seeing pictures from the Holocaust. So I don't know if there's Ukrainian uh, theater on that that deals with it uh, or not. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. You know more than I do, obviously, a lot more than I do. Uh, what is the place of it in, in, in conversation today, in culture, in here it just begins. I'm sorry? I would say that here in, in Ukraine, uh, Holocaust just begins to take uh, his place. Uh, people just begin to talk about it. Yes, but also Ukraine, the Ukrainian uh, has have their own um, tradition. Tradi 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 yeah, like uh, Holodomor, and uh, also a lot of people, and that in, uh, killed in, um, uh, in the war. Yeah, so maybe here also Holocaust is not um, on, the same, on the same place as uh, it's in. Because I saw that in Germany they're obsessed with it, and another country was, <laughs> in a way, are obsessed with it in, from a different day, it was Poland. In Poland, there's constantly talk about about Jews <coughs> and about uh, unbelievable. Um, in fact, I was I was in Poland last year, in because in Gdansk, in the, the, the national museum, uh, there was a um, an exhibition called Guess, the book. Mm -hmm. The entire uh, museum was devoted to it, but the devil became a much, much bigger topic, and, and I, I, the people who were there were mostly Poles. It was a conference, and they invited me to talk, and they said to me, everybody in Poland knows Dybbuk, everybody knows what it means, and in a way, the Jews who were no longer there, because of the war, became the Dybbuk of Polish society. They can't get rid of it. They, they keep going back to it. They keep talking about it. And the word devil, they said, is so common that even in, a, in a, some, some uh, instructions for children how to behave, and, and I don't remember all the details, but basically they had a character called Dibok. Well, so. they also a movie. Uh, yes, in 1937, uh, it was a Polish movie that did. Yeah, and, and it was a is, Jewish, yeah, but it's a Jewish Polish. But, but Polish production, and it was uh, very successful in Poland. Yeah, until 39. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So when, when Yevtushenko wrote about Babi Yar, was there anything here? It didn't create? No, we've got a memorial central, but oh. it was built just a year ago. A year ago? Yeah. Or a year ago, mm -hmm. maybe. So it's, it's mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. What we no. had before that uh, that uh, every year they have ceremony, but it was local Jewish. We have here um, uh, ambas uh, Jewish amb uh, ambassador, embassy. embassy, Jewish embassy. They usually do all this ceremony, and uh, we have uh, many uh, a lot of Jewish organizations that they study Holocaust, and also we have a special program for. For, children, for teachers, Jewish for and non-Jewish teachers, who um, study Holocaust and who teach Holocaust to un-Jewish children. And we have a lot of programs in Ukraine that uh, involve uh, Ukrainians to study Holocaust and uh, maybe it's... But it's... Uh, I agree that it's something new, but it's new maybe 10 years before. <laughs> so it's not just a year, but... Uh, uh, the last year it was a great series uh, because of uh, um, all this Maidan. It became very, very um, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, you know, um, the Russian media want to tell that Ukraine is anti-Semitic. Is uh, is uh, anti-Semitic? 
anti-Semitic society also because of all this uh, uh, Holocaust that Ukrainians took part in Holocaust. Uh -huh. uh, it, is, it, it was a lot of uh, uh, propaganda and Ukrainian uh, government wanted to show that it's not true uh -huh. because uh, it was and it was the people in Ukraine that uh, that uh, it was a righteous of the nation that helped uh, Jews and also uh, maybe <coughs> this year, the last year, it was a great ceremony in Babi Yar mm -hmm. with all the government, with uh, um, maybe many European countries, the uh, government came to visit Babi Yar and it starts, it, it uh, starts a big, uh, uh, it's, it's not a new beginning, but it's the first time that it was a huge ceremony and it's, they said that it's a part of Ukrainian tragedy. Uh -huh. Not a Soviet, uh, as Yevtushenko said, it's a, like a Soviet uh, tragedy, but it's really Ukrainian tragedy. So it's all this... I have to, uh, I'll finish with a little anecdote from yesterday. <laughs> I sat with Irina and she showed me pictures of various documents and things from the museum. And then she shows me a, a picture of a crystal vase, a small vase, mm -hmm. nothing particularly special, you know. This yeah, it will be better at this museum. And, and she tells me that the, the vase was given by Michoels, you know who Michoels yes. was? When he came to Kiev, he gave it to the local head of Cosette. And the vat inside was filled with seedlings of various plants, of various, uh, of various flowers. And uh, Michal said to him, which I'm sure he was not supposed to say, take it and put it in Babi Yard, so these things will grow there as a commemoration. So it's, it's quite, quite a story. I'm sh sure his bosses in, in, in Moscow would not like <coughs> to hear it, but he did it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.